Well, yes, I hope you had a good break. Um, let's get back into our subject. Uh, so we have um, covered up to verse 39. Uh, if we can have one person read out verses 40 up to 46, uh, so John chapter 1, uh, verse 40 up to verse 46, if we can have someone read out, please. Thank you so much for all of you who are reading. You know, it really makes it um, easier for me. Thank you so much. Yeah. Someone can go ahead. Okay, whoever has come back from their break and has rejoined the class, if you could read John chapter 1, verses 40 to 46. Does this mean that no one has rejoined after the break? John chapter 1, verse, verse 40 to 46, Pastor. Yes, thank you. Okay. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Christ. Now, when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated as stone. Philip and Nathanael. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth the son of Joseph. Amen. Uh, was 46 as well, please? Okay. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Yes, Amen. Philip gives a very good reply. He says, You come and find out for yourself whether anything good can come out of Nazareth. Um, so uh, in verses 40 to 46, uh, we see that um, Andrew immediately goes and tells his brother that they have found the Messiah. And when um, Peter comes to Jesus, uh, Jesus speaks to him and says, I know that you know your name is Simon, son of John, but I am going to be giving you a new name, um, which is Cephas. Um, that would be your Aramaic word, uh, which means uh, rock. Peter, I guess, would be the Greek word, which means rock. So um, these are all different languages which are being used over here, but they all basically are referring to a rock. Uh, so even though Jesus sees Peter the way he is right now, currently, uh, he accepts him and also shows him what he is going to be in the future. Now, this applies for all of us who come to Jesus, you know, uh, with this eagerness to become his followers, to become his disciples. When we come, we come rather raw. Uh, we are not very pleasant. Uh, we are very unfinished. Uh, we are. Um, we have a lot of defects. We may not even be very pleasant people, uh, you know. But there's this desire somewhere inside that we want our life changed, that we want to reach out to God, and that God will do something for us. So with that eagerness, we come to Him, and He looks at us in our imperfect state, and He loves us and He accepts us. There's no rejection from His side. He doesn't say, oh, you are too rotten you know, for me. No. No person ever has to approach the Lord and fear rejection. He will accept every person who comes to him. So that is guaranteed. He loves us as we are. 
He accepts us, but he doesn't want us to stay where we are. He wants us to become something much more because now we have someone divine backing us up. Now we have someone divine working on our behalf in our life. So we don't have to stay where we are. We can rise up to the level that he has in mind for us. He has a greater status for us and we can reach that. So, you know, he may not speak in uh, audible words to us the way he did over here with Peter. But when he looks at each of us, he, say, he says to us, you know, OK, this is who you are right now. But this is who you're going to be in the future. And there's, there's, a, there's a name that he probably has, a term, a, a phrase, which will describe what we will be when we know when we attain that new status. So we are all headed towards something higher, something better. So uh, if a person is coming to Jesus just for a free ticket to heaven, uh, then uh, this is not going to work. Because uh, when we go to him, he accepts us as we are. But no, he doesn't want us to stay as we are. He has something higher, better. So the work of polishing us is going to begin. The work of disciplining us will begin because he loves us. You know, like it says in Hebrews, he corrects those whom he loves. The reason that he is going to be disciplining us and uh, sharpening us and polishing us is because he loves us. And so I do not know what people had been saying about Simon, son of John. You know, especially because this man, uh, whatever we, we see of his personality type from the Gospels, we see that he's a very impulsive person, very open hearted and very spontaneous. You know, first acts and then thinks, you know, so he's that type. Uh, so who knows how many fixes he's gotten himself into because of his nature. And so people probably tell him, you know, you need to be a little more um, calm headed. Think before you act. It's probably what they say to him. They may not have a very high opinion of him. But now Jesus looks at this man and says, no, this is who you have been your whole life. Simon, son of Jonah. But uh, sorry, not Jonah, John. Simon, son of John. But now you're going to be something more. A day is going to come when you are going to be Cephas, the rock. And that is who I'm going to start calling you even from now, so that you will always remember that you're not going to remain just this Simon but you are going to continue progressing in your walk with me until you become this Cephas. And we see the impact this Cephas had you know, on the early church uh, later. I mean, what a man he became. Uh, so uh, the Lord can take any one of us and turn us into uh, someone you know, of an equal caliber as this Peter. It is possible. Why? Because uh, we have someone divine working on our behalf, someone who's willing to you know, think about us every moment. You know, like it says in Psalm 139, the number of thoughts you think towards me, oh Lord, you know, I mean, I cannot even count them. You know, we can really apply that scripture to ourselves. God is constantly thinking of us. He's now you know, taken us into his hand. And so he says that he is going to make us into, um, you know, make us Christ-like. So we never have to limit ourselves and think, oh, I am going to stay this way because this is who I am. No. There's another phrase that he has in mind for each of us. It would be very interesting if we knew what it was. Uh, maybe he reveals it to some of us, but some of us may not know that, know what it is that he, we are going to turn into. But yes, he has something beautiful for all of us. That's a very powerful learning that we can take away from this, uh, you know, from these verses. So uh, Philip is also someone that Jesus approaches and says, follow me. Philip does not ask any questions. He doesn't make any comments. He is he's, he's completely ready. And so he just, uh, you know, agrees. He accepts and he begins to follow Jesus. And he is the one who goes and informs Nathaniel. And he says, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law. In those first five books of the Torah, the person that he uh, was always indicating towards, we have found him. And you know who it is? It is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel is very disappointed when he hears about 
who this person is and from which place he is. He says, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Because at least if he had said Jerusalem, you know, then it would have made sense. But he is saying this person is from Nazareth. What on earth are you going to pick up in Nazareth? You know, uh, uh, not exactly the center of spiritual learning, uh, not exactly the place where religious leaders get made. So he is rather disappointed. And Philip, sensible man, he says, come and see for yourself. You know, then you will know whether this is uh, well, what can actually come out of Nazareth. You can see it for yourself. And uh, so we see Nathaniel coming over here to, uh, to see Jesus. And uh, because Jesus knows that Nathaniel is hesitant, that he needs a little additional boost. There are some who are so open in their heart to the things of God. Uh, you just have to, God just has to say the word, you know, like Philip, someone like Philip. God just has to say, follow me, and Philip will follow because he's all ready. But there are going to be some like Nathaniel who have a lot of thoughts running to their minds and they need a little additional boost. And so Jesus understands that. And so even as Jesus sees him approaching, he says to him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Here is a man who will speak frankly, who will not... Think one thing and say one thing. Whatever is in his heart, he will say it out. You know, which is we see an example of that. You know, just in the previous verse, where he very frankly and openly says, you know, uh, what good can come out of Nazareth. So he's a person who speaks his mind, is frank, is not deceitful. So Jesus says, "I know that's the kind of person that you are." And um, how do you know me? Nathaniel says. And Jesus says, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. So now this is something that nobody could have known, uh, you know, unless um, they are divine. And uh, so when even Philip did not know, right? Because I mean, Philip only came and spoke to him after he had, you know, finished sitting under the fig tree. Uh, so here we see that Jesus says, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. And when Nathaniel uh, hears this, he says, my, you really must be the son of God. Okay, So now all his doubts are removed. And he says, Rabbi, you're not just Rabbi, you're the son of God. You are the king of Israel. So now Nathaniel is very excited, as excited as all the others. Um, so when we have that attitude of learning, you know, God uh, uh, speaks to us. Uh, all these people. They all came to Jesus um, in different ways. Two of them had become disciples of John the Baptist so that they can learn and start getting ready. Um, and then uh, they went and told others about this Jesus. So different people came to Jesus differently. And Jesus speaks to each of them very intentionally. He will give you what you need for your uh, you know, for, for you for you to begin your walk with him, what you require to hear from him, he will speak that. So Jesus is very intentional in the way he communicates with each of the people who come to him. Nobody is sent away empty handed. So if you have that desire to know him more, to reach out to him and connect with him, he will complete the connection. Okay, so all you need to do is be eager to want to go back to him each day and connect with him. It's you, you know, the branch um, uh, re-establishing your connection in the vine. So even as you do that with him each day, he will give you what you require for that day. He will speak to you what you need to hear, what you require to move on through that day and through the rest of your life with him. He will give you what you need, but you would have to make time. So Nathaniel had to actually set aside his other responsibilities and tasks and make time for someone who had come from Nazareth. It's, it's an effort that he had to take. And he had this joyous revelation that now he has met the very son of God. So if we go to the Lord, for five minutes in the morning and say, Lord, speak to me, it probably will not happen. So we need to have a hunger that is great enough 
that will hold us in his presence long enough for him to share something of value with us. If we don't give him that time, if Nathaniel had not taken that effort to, you know, go there and speak to Jesus, uh, what he encountered would not have happened. So the Lord is very intentional. He knows exactly what you need to hear from him, what you need to receive from him. He is ready to give it. But we need to make time to go and establish that connection from our side. The wine is always there waiting. But the branch has to decide that it's going to reinforce its connection with that wine every single day. And we choose to do that when we spend time with him. He will very intentionally minister to us. We will come away from that quiet time having received what we need for our day, for our week, for our life. You know, so um, if we make the time, we will see that the Lord is there to provide us with exactly what we require. Now, Jesus goes on to say some uh, other things to Nathaniel. Um, we could maybe look at those. Uh, verses. Uh, if, some, if, we, if we can have someone read out uh, verses 50 and 51. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe you will see greater things than these? And he said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, hereafter you shall see heavens, heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Very interesting things that Jesus says to Nathaniel. He says, you know, you're so um, pleased and surprised that I'm talking about you being under the fig tree. Uh, but there are going to be greater revelations that you're going to be receiving. And he says, there's going to be a day when you'll actually see the heavens open. And you'll see the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, we are not given any um, explanation by John the writer regarding this matter. So we don't really know in what way Nathaniel got to see this. Did he see a vision? You know, the way Jacob saw a vision and saw people, uh, angels climbing up the ladder to heaven and coming down from heaven, you know, to the earth on the ladder. Uh, because this wording seems to be similar to that. Uh, in Jacob's uh, vision, which he had in the Old Testament, um, he sees an open ladder and there are angels bringing messages from God to the people down here. And, there are, and, and then they're, they, they, you know, they're probably collecting the prayer requests of people down here and going up the ladder to deliver them to God. Uh, it's all, of course, very symbolic. God doesn't need someone to come all the way up the ladder to him and tell him what we need. Uh, you know, he is all knowing. So it's basically symbolic language that is being used about how there is a connection between heaven and earth. And in Jacob's vision, it was a ladder that was connecting. But here it's going to be a person who is going to be the connection, the son of man. He is going to be the direct connection between heaven and earth. And uh, so the angels that are ministering will be ministering, you know, uh, under him, through him. So he is going to connect heaven and earth and he's going to, you know, use his angels uh, to do his bidding. Uh, so was Jesus saying, you're going to get to know more about me and you're going to find out that I am the link between heaven and earth. And it is, you know, uh, through me that the angels do their work and, uh, you know, see my will being done. So was he just explaining that to him? Or was Jesus saying that he would actually have a vision one day and see this with his own eyes? You know, that Jesus being the link between heaven and earth, would he actually see it in some kind of vision form? We do not know the details. But uh, God says there are greater revelations ahead awaiting you. And so we can say the same thing, you know, for ourselves as well. When we make the time to go into his presence, he is very intentional in what he reveals to us. Maybe Nathaniel needed to, you know, uh, see this at some point of time. And so Jesus chooses to reveal this particular detail to him at, you know, uh, at whichever point of time God had appointed for him to know this. In the same way for us, there are greater revelations ahead. But all those revelations will are all dependent on us creating the time to go and sit in his presence. It's not just going to happen. We have to create the time. 
And if we do that, he is ready and waiting and he will be very intentional in what he reveals to us, what we require, what revelations we need for our personal life, for our family, for our ministry. Those are the things that he would reveal to us. So uh, here we see him promising Nathaniel that much greater things are going to be coming. And there's a term that uh, Jesus uses over here in referring to himself. He calls himself the son of man. Now, when, it, when he uses the term son of man over here, he's um, not talking about humans. He's using a technical term. He's referring to a prophecy about the son of man, which was made uh, you know, by Daniel. So that is the son of man that he's talking about. He's not just talking about any human being who's just a son of man. He's talking about the son of man who was prophesied about in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. That son of man, he is going to become the link between heaven and earth. He is the one through whom the angels will go and do their ministry. Uh, so let's turn to Daniel chapter 7. Let's look at verses 13 and 14. If we can have someone read out for us, please. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Now, uh, people like Nathaniel and uh, the other disciples who, you know, who were preparing themselves for the Messiah, and uh, the Pharisees and all the religious leaders would be very familiar with these verses. So they would know that one day this Messiah is going to come, and he would be the son of man, not just a son of man, but the son of man, the one who would go before and stand before the ancient of days and receive all authority and glory and sovereign power. This is the son of man who would rule over all the nations and everyone would bow down before him and he would have everlasting dominion over all of them. They knew that this is the Messiah who is going to be coming to them. So whenever Jesus used the term son of man for himself, he was saying very openly, I am that person that Daniel talked about. He is saying this prophecy has been fulfilled in me. So Nathaniel probably is familiar with his scriptures and therefore Jesus uses this term you know, with him and calls himself the son of man so that uh, Nathaniel will be assured that yes, he is indeed the person in whom the prophecy of Daniel has been fulfilled. Um, now, if you look over here, you know, uh, generally the term Messiah by that by the time of these people, by the time uh, the Jesus time had come on the earth, uh, by that time, this term Messiah had acquired a very political overtone because for so many generations, the people had been telling each other, Messiah, Messiah will come. When he comes, he will sit on the throne. He will dethrone the Caesar, Caesar who you know who's, who has control over us right now. So somewhere along the way, they had decided that Messiah is equal to political king. They have they were not even willing to consider any other options. But here, when we when we look at this Daniel chapter seven passage, um, we see that it is uh, talking about an everlasting dominion in the end times now this is not something that the people of that time you know uh, of jesus times would have caught they were thinking that this everlasting dominion is going to happen right then and there you know during their lifetime uh, so uh, jesus chooses to use this term son of man uh, maybe you know to also indicate that this these are events which will take place at the end of time 
um, and not immediately right now. So right now is going to be more their lamb rather than um, this, um, you know, rather than this one who is going to have dominion over everyone. So uh, he is probably hinting at these things, you know, when, whenever he uses the term son of man, referring to the end of time when uh, the son of man will come with the clouds of heaven. All right. Uh, we will now move into chapter 2. And in chapter 2, John chooses to uh, place two events in front of us. You know, each of the gospel writers, when they wrote their gospel, uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they arranged the events as they were led by the Lord to convey certain messages. When we look at certain passages, the way they are arranged, uh, it is because all of those particular passages are trying to bring out one central theme, one central teaching. So, uh, you know, when you're doing your Bible study, if you were to carefully observe that, let us say, you know, on that particular day, you have decided that you're going to be studying John chapter 15. It would be interesting for you to just take a look at John chapter 14 and then look also very briefly at chapter 16, just to see the flow of thought. Because these writers, every one of these gospel writers, when they wrote, they were inspired by the Holy Spirit to put down the events and the teachings in a certain order to convey something very clear and definite. So it always helps when you are doing your personal Bible study, you know, during your personal devotions to focus, of course, on the passage which you have chosen for that day, but also just quickly look at what is above. Look at what is below, and you sometimes you'll discover that there's a there's a flow of thought running through that entire passage, and it kind of makes you uh, catch the broader perspective. You know, it's uh, it, it, so here he uh, John very specifically chooses to start off his description of Jesus' ministry by mentioning two specific incidents. The first, of course, is the uh, wedding feast where Jesus has, you know, gone as a guest. Um, so maybe we can have someone read out uh, verses uh, 1, 2, and 3, John chapter 2. Uh, if someone could read out for us the first three verses, please. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now about Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding, and when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Yeah. So um, uh, we are told that on the third day of the wedding, the wine runs out. You know, uh, for us today, because especially maybe because of the expensive world that we live in, uh, for us, the wedding ceremony is two hours, at the most, maybe five hours, never goes beyond that. We simply couldn't afford the expenditure. <laughs> Uh, in those days, a wedding would last seven days. And now we see that only three days have gone by and the wine supply is already run out. It's a bit of a disgrace, um, especially because uh, wine had a kind of um, um, symbolic significance during weddings. You see, it was considered a symbol of joy. Okay, so um, uh, you generously give wine to your guests uh, to kind of symbolize that this is an occasion of joy and that there's going to be much joy in the couple uh, in, in the life of the couple that has now come together and uh, so it's all about celebration and uh, expressing joy if your wine has run out it's like as if you're saying oh, okay it's all done finished no joy left it's rather um, uh, bad symbolically for the couple. It's like as if you're saying, you know, uh, yeah, the wine didn't even last throughout the festivities. Goodness knows what's going to happen in the rest of your marriage. You know, so because that wine is supposed to symbolize joy. Uh, it symbolizes the celebration of something new and 
beautiful that is that god is doing in their lives so it it actually had a uh, symbolic meaning it's not that you know you you need to you know uh, ply your guests with enough beverages to keep them happy it's not just that uh, this more uh, you know the, in their culture it held significance and so you know in our own nations you know when we have our wedding ceremonies we have this certain features they hold uh, some significance and if you disrupt that it kind of uh, casts a shadow on the entire ceremony you know so so this was something important uh, for that particular family and uh, so when the wine runs out uh, you know uh, mary immediately comes to jesus uh, to ask for his help and then we see jesus response uh, so uh, we can look at verses 4 and 5 if we could have someone read out for us please verses 4 and 5 Jesus said to her woman what does our cons your concern have to do with me my hour has not yet come his mother said to the servants whatever he says to you do it so um here you know uh, Jesus refers to his mother as woman now of course that sounds really bad to us in our um, uh, you know current day um, uh, set up uh, simply because we we tend to use this term in a derogatory manner uh, but in the greek when that word was first spoken it was a common greek salutation a formal term that you would use to address women with respect it's like us today saying ma'am you know uh instead of saying you know hey you or something like that or a woman you know we would rather politely go up to a person and say ma'am we are showing respect so in the um, you know in those days uh, when jesus used that term he was in no way being dishonorable in fact he was using a very respectable term something that we we could say is the equivalent of our current day ma'am and so he uses that term and he says to her why are you getting me involved in this um, you know this is not something that i should get involved in right now um, so immediately when he responds that way mary would have caught what he is saying because you see at home he addresses her as mother you know that's the term that he would use but here he is not addressing her as uh, her son he is talking to her in his official capacity as the messiah and so this immediately when he refers to her in this formal manner calling her ma'am rather than calling her mama or mother or whatever he generally you know refers to her as immediately she would have understood he now he is not speaking to me as my son he is now speaking to me in his official capacity in which god has sent him over here onto this earth and so in his official capacity jesus is saying this is not something that i should be getting involved in right now why are you getting me you know my because my hour has not yet come is a divine time table that has been set up and according to this divine time table his public ministry is supposed to be beginning on a certain day and today is not that day and we look at uh, mary's response she says to the servants do whatever he tells you she backs off she does not continue pressurizing him she understands that he is coming over here to the earth with a purpose he is going to be doing things his way god's way and she has no right to interfere in that so she just backs off she accepts whatever he has said in simple trust and she says to the servants he is going to tell you what to do whatever he says to do you just do that no there's no pressure from her side you no know, saying uh, you know you no know, you must provide the wine no you must take care of this need she um submits in simple trust okay so um this is something that we see um uh, something that we can learn from when we place our requests before the lord and the lord you know in case he says no then i think the best response for us would be 
to just do whatever he says you know rather than pressurizing and saying no no i need to have it this way no you don't understand the circumstances are like this a cultural setting is like this that couple is going to be disgraced no no arguments no explanations she just backs off and she says uh, to the servants whatever he he considers best whatever he says just do that and it's a very uh, amazing response of trust and an amazing response of humility she's the woman who brought him up but now she backs off you know she doesn't say oh i am your mother i'm the one who you know like you know we have this uh, dialogue which mothers say to their children i carried you in the womb for 9 months what do you know what i went through so you know you need to have some sense of loyalty and submit to me is what you know mothers say nowadays but here in jesus case you know mary does not make any such claims because she understands that she too is just a follower a disciple of this jesus who is who is now standing before her in his official capacity and so she just humbles herself she backs off and she says to the servants let him decide whatever he says let that be done you know so we see humility over here accepting who she is that she is just a disciple and also the trust the level of trust he will do what is right he will do what he considers best for the situation so she recognizes the fact that he does care about this family he is going to be concerned about them and he will do for them what he regards as best so she leaves it in his hands um and because of this level of trust which she has demonstrated in just saying do whatever he tells you jesus changes his divine timetable it's amazing i mean this lady she has submitted uh, with such humility and trust that it moves the heart of god to change his divine timetable now this is not the first time that it happens in scripture we see it happening you know on different occasions in the old testament uh, you know um, one example that we could take is of uh, nineveh you know where um, in another 40 days according to the divine timetable judgment is supposed to come upon nineveh uh, but then uh, because those people repent and respond with humility and trust just like me you know mary does over here uh, the judgment gets delayed by another 150 years you know so god changed his divine timetable on that particular occasion um and so in the same way we have different uh, you know instances mentioned in the old testament where god says i am I, i will do this thing and then when the person you know cries out to him and says lord you know give me another opportunity god chooses to change his divine timetable regarding those particular matters so here we see the same thing happening now this is something that could happen even for us are you willing to show that level of humility and trust where rather than arguing and saying lord you don't understand the circumstances you don't know what we are facing over here you don't know what is at stake rather than coming up with silly absurd arguments like that if we can instead choose to be like mary and say whatever you say do whatever you consider best i leave it in your hands because i know that you are someone who can be trusted with my interests you will do what is best for me you have that kind of a heart i know your character lord so i choose to submit so when mary adopted this attitude jesus in fact changes his time table and says all right you know i'm going to get involved in this uh, in this event which is taking place um so um maybe we can uh, read verses uh 6 up to verse 10 yeah if we can have someone uh, you know now we are kind of running out of time so if someone could you know read quickly uh verse 6 up to verse 10 please now there were set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the jews containing 20 or 30 gallons a piece jesus said to them fill the water pots with water and they filled them up to the brim and he said to them draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast and they took it 
when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from but the servants who had drawn the water knew the master of the feast called the bridegroom and he said to him every man at the beginning sets out the good wine and when the guests have well drunk then the inferior you have kept the good wine until now yes um so we see that jesus takes the water which is available over there now this is good water uh, it is it's meant to be used for ceremonial washing uh, so um, you know uh, it has some kind of religious significance and uh, so this is good water which is standing over there and jesus uses that he turns it into wine it's interesting that when he, when he tells the servants to fill it up with water uh, they are not the lazy type who just maybe fill up one fourth or even half these are these seem to be sincere servants who actually take the effort to fill it up to the brim because you see if they had only filled it up one fourth you would only have one fourth jar of uh, wine on the other hand because they took the effort to fill it up to the brim now you have a lot more wine available when the miracle happens so maybe one small learning from this we can take away uh, you know we say to the lord do whatever you know whatever you want whatever you tell us to do we will do it once we say that when the lord asks us to do something how do we do it do we go all the way up to the brim or do we just do a little bit you know and leave it at that the answer the miracle that we receive may actually depend on to what extent we did what he asked us to do so uh, obedience becomes very important over here so when when we when we say to the lord i'm submitting to you whatever you want me to do i will do it when we say that and he tells us what we should do how do we do it are we going up to the brim because then the miracle that we receive will be greater or are we doing it half heartedly thinking what's going to be achieved by doing this this is anyway not going to solve my problem if we go with that attitude and do whatever he's telling us to do half heartedly the miracle may be very very small and we would be the losers so you know that's one thing that maybe we can carry away from this um but coming to the next uh, you know uh, sentence which can which is which can be quite significant verse 11 uh it says what jesus did here in cana of galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him so here it talks about how this became jesus decides to you know move the entire timetable up a little bit and so he starts doing his signs signs which will indicate who he is so he decides that this is going to be his first sign through which he is going to reveal his glory and it's interesting that uh, you know uh, this particular event reveals so much about his glory the water that was used uh, to turn you know into wine that actually was water used for ceremonial you know uh, cleansing is what it mentions over there in the earlier verse so all these people were using that water most respectfully to wash their hands and feet uh, because the pharisees you know had given some kind of religious significance to that and uh, so by doing that you would become as clean as the pharisees on the outside you would be clean but on the inside oh my jesus says they are like uh, graves with rotting flesh on the inside you know so that is what those jars of water can do but now when jesus turns that water into wine he is pointing to the day when his blood will be you know uh, commemorated as you know wine during our communion and that wine it points towards the blood of jesus which not only cleanses you on the outside but even it can cleanse you on the inside and make you into a new person who can actually honor god and you know follow him 
so jesus is revealing his glory at a very basic level by showing mercy to that family by showing that he can you know go against the laws of chemistry and physics and you know transform something in a matter of minutes into wine yes or he is doing all of that is revealing his glory at that level but he's also revealing his glory at a much higher level he's saying when i shed my blood that is not just going to cleanse you on the outside the way the ceremonial purification cleanses you i can clean you right through where every sin is forgiven and you are restored into a right relationship with god i have the power to do that and you will be commemorating this for many many centuries to come where each time you drink wine this is what you will be reminding yourselves of so there's a connection between what jesus does over here and what he's going to accomplish later on on the cross uh, we see that connection now coming to the other event which is mentioned over here you know we are very familiar with that so i would just like to maybe bring out one or two points uh, from that uh, story which would be in verses 13 to 17 where it talks about how jesus goes to the temple and he sees all these people sitting over there you know selling the um, the animals and the birds which will be used as sacrifices and there are also people sitting over there who will you know do the money exchange because people are going to be coming from different countries uh, to you know give their sacrifices and so they would uh, they would need to exchange their foreign currency with the local currency so all these people have settled down over there and uh, because they have occupied the entire temple court uh, the gentiles are unable to come and stand over there and worship so if you look in uh, the other gospels uh, matthew mark and luke you know if you look at the other gospels the emphasis is on that aspect because all these people are merchants are sitting over there in the courtyard there is no place left for the gentiles to come and stand over there quietly you know in a in, in a humble manner and focus their thoughts on god how are you supposed to focus your thoughts on god when somebody is screaming next to you saying you know uh, this is the rate for my sheep this is the rate for my doves i mean um, it's like a, they've turned it to a, into a marketplace so the other gospels emphasize that point where uh, they have turned this house of prayer into a marketplace and the gentiles are unable to stand over there quietly and connect with the living god here john um places his emphasis on a slightly different aspect and when we look in john chapter 2 verses uh, 16 and 17 this is what it says over there it says to those who sold doves he said get these out of here stop turning my father's house into a market his disciples remembered that it is written zeal for your house will consume me so over here john chooses to emphasize the other aspect where jesus is offended that they are turning a holy place into a commercial place where money is what rules god doesn't matter money is what matters so he says you are corrupting my father's house so both i mean the the, the other writers and john are bringing out different aspects of this of of what has happened over here so you we can maybe you know just sum up and say jesus is, is upset about two things one that the gentiles will not be able to stand over there and connect with god the way they had hoped to do and the other aspect which john touches upon jesus is angry that they have taken something so holy and sacred as the temple court and turned it into a marketplace where money is all that matters where his presence doesn't even matter you know so he is angry with that and that is why he takes action against them um and um why does john choose this particular uh, story because you see the jews will ask him the question next they will say by whose authority are you doing this you know all these years these people have been sitting over here and doing their you know selling who are you to ask them to leave and jesus explains and says you know what i am this temple right now you're looking at one physical temple and considering it so great but i myself am the temple and so he goes on to say you know this temple if it is destroyed 
it will like i will raise it up again in 3 days so he is basically saying to them i am this temple i am what this temple is all about and i have arrived and now i am going to set certain things in motion and it's all going to lead finally to redemption so he is publicly declaring and saying i performed a sign in cana to reveal my glory and now i am declaring to you my authority as well and so from now on the next chapter onwards we are going to be seeing his glory manifested in so many different ways and we are going to see his authority being declared in so many different ways okay so that's basically what this chapter 2 is all about um so um uh, as nobody has posted any questions maybe we can close with a word of prayer why don't you have any questions it always makes it so interesting when people you know ask their doubts or when people just give their comments you know their things which they have wish to say regarding these verses uh, but anyway maybe we can do that next class so uh, let's close with a word of prayer we thank you so much your lord for your for the learnings that we could uh, gather from your word today your word is so rich oh lord there's something significant that we can learn from every single verse we pray oh lord that we will not just be hearers of this but that lord we will apply these things to our own lives so that we will grow in our relationship with you draw closer to you and see your glory manifested in our life and our situations help us oh lord be with us and lord guide us thank you lord in jesus name amen amen thank you so much uh, for logging in and staying up to the end and we'll meet again next class